Story continued from Hell Creek Playlist. The sun is setting and a light shower is falling over the region. A full 12 hours has passed since the male Tyrannosaurus Rex was chased from his last kill by a rival. Since then, he has disappeared into the denser forests of his territory, his whereabouts unknown. There is ample signs of a much smaller theropod. Moving from one water source to another is a flock of Ornithomimus. Between three and four meters long, they are far smaller than the heavyweights that call this area home, such as Triceratops, Edmontosaurus, and Alamosaurus. But one does not need to be large to face threats, when one can simply outrun any danger. These feathered dinosaurs don't just look like ostriches, they are about as fast as them as well. One of the fastest animals on the planet at this time, in fact. They have to be. Large T-Rex can't match their speed, but juveniles can get close. Not to mention their biggest threat, the ghost of the forest. Dakota Raptor. They thrive in the lowlands, often sticking close to rivers and marshes, as this is where many of the plants they prefer can be found. But Ornithomimus are omnivores, and they also get much of the meat they need from these areas as well. Frogs, salamanders, infant crocodilians, if it's small enough to go down their long necks, they will snatch it up. The group currently walking through the thick section of the forest has just finished with one river, and is silently making their way to another. On the way, there are still plenty of meals to be found. Lizards, small mammals, insects, and occasionally, a newly hatched bird chick that has fallen from the nest. Ornithomimus, while picky when it comes to their greens, aren't so when it comes to getting plenty of protein. They have chosen a particularly difficult path, however, the foliage is so thick, they often have to find a different way around the denser sections of plants, or squeeze through trees and vines. Many of them have leaves, twigs, and other material clinging to their feathers, tails, and limbs. When they hear a noise, however, they all freeze like statues. A predator could easily hide in this terrain, so the group checks every sound, and are always searching with their large eyes. Their sense of smell is poor compared to most theropods, the price to pay for evolving a beak. If it were better, they may have picked up the scent of dead flesh, or the scent of the Tyrannosaurus that the flesh was attached to. Laying down completely immobile, surrounded by the thick foliage, the male Tyrannosaurus can hear the approaching Ornithomimus not too far away. It is only coincidence that he is near them, as he lay down to sleep a few hours ago, only waking at their arrival. He cannot see them through the forest vegetation, but neither can they, so he waits, hoping they come close enough for him to get a chance at catching them. The problem isn't that he is far slower than them, and needs every advantage he can get. It is his wounded leg. Simply walking on it is painful, but rising from the ground has been excruciating. The hunt may come down to if he can rise fast enough in the first place. The Ornithomimus flock force their way through the restrictive undergrowth, with no clue how close they are to danger. There are over 40 of them, of various ages and sizes, and all are quickly getting impatient with how slow their progress is going. Descending down from the trees comes a tiny pterosaur, a juvenile, Quetzalcoatlus, with barely a 30 centimeter wingspan. It may be hard to believe, but this little male could grow to be one of the largest flying animals of all time. The youngster is foraging for insects, and evidently hasn't learned that Ornithomimus definitely see him as prey. Three individuals see the Quetzalcoatlus land and move in his direction. Two bump into one another, and while still walking begin to peck at each other, letting out annoyed chirps. Three more hear this, and also move to get at the pterosaur, pushing into the first three. The Quetzalcoatlus sees the approaching dinosaurs and tries to take off, but he hasn't quite gotten used to launching from the ground, so when he throws himself into the air, he only gets about half a meter before needing to land and try again. The six Ornithomimus peck and screech at each other, 
as they close the gap between themselves and the struggling flying reptile. One gets close and snaps his jaws at the little flyer, just missing as he finally ascends out of their reach and disappears back into the canopy. It flies directly over the prone body of the Tyrannosaurus Rex, who the Ornithomimus have unknowingly run right towards. Hearing his prey so close, the male seized his chance and put all his effort into standing up. The Ornithomimus flock couldn't believe their eyes as the tyrant seemed to rise up directly in front of them. The male went from completely still to standing to his full height of 4 meters, and the pain that coursed through his leg was agony. The wounded limb screamed in protest, and he let out a cold, curdling hiss that exited his throat in a rasp gurgle, but he pushed through it and turned to lunge at the smaller theropods. The Ornithomimus squawked in terror, the whole flock darted in any direction they could, scattering amongst the sea of green, but it was the six closest to him that cried out the loudest, pushing against each other madly trying to escape certain death. In the end, it was the dense vegetation that made the difference. What slowed down the Ornithomimus did nothing to impede the Rex, and the male rounded on the nearest six. He lifted up his head to the left, and then swung it to the right in a wide arc, battering it against the three of the smaller dinosaurs. For the lightweight Ornithomimus, it was like being struck by a train. The impact killed two of them instantly, sending all three flailing across the ground, their bodies broken. The Tyrannosaurus stopped and watched the remaining Ornithomimus run away from him, too fast to be worth a chase, and besides, he had got what he wanted. One of the Ornithomimus was still alive, and it cried out in defiance, trying to crawl away from the male. He put an end to its suffering by picking it up in his jaws and swallowing it whole. At long last, he had secured a meal for his mate, waiting patiently for his return at their nest. As he sated his own hunger with the first Ornithomimus, he picked up the second in his jaws to take to her, but struggled to grasp the third. His jaws and teeth were evolved for crushing, so delicate tasks such as this didn't come naturally. After a while, however, he got both of the bodies in his mouth, and though racked with pain, started the long journey back to his home, hoping his mate was still waiting for him. The fate of their unhatched offspring depended on it. Hello fellow travellers and welcome back. Today we will be breaking down one of the last surviving Ornithomimids, Ornithomimus itself. The first remains of Ornithomimus were discovered in the Denver Formation of Colorado on June 30th, 1889, and consisted of a partial hind limb and forelimb. These were named by Ophniel Charles Marsh in 1890 as Ornithomimus velox. The species name meaning swift, and the genus name meaning bird mimic. Many more remains would be found and attributed to Ornithomimus. Marsh himself would name two more species, and over the next century, 17 species would be named, being treated much like a wastebasket taxon. So it was inevitable that most of these species would be assigned to new genera or found to be pre-existing ones. For instance, some remains turned out to belong to Tyrannosaurs or even Avelosaurs. Some were in the same family as Ornithomimus, such as Archaeornithomimus and Dromeochiromimus. Much of this reclassification was done in the 60s and 70s by Dale Russell, who also helped lay down how to distinguish the differences between all these closely related animals. By the end, only two genera were valid for Ornithomimus, those being the original, Velox, and Edmontonicus, named in 1933. Because of this, we have very little fossil remains still attributed to Ornithomimus velox, with only the holotype known for certain to belong to that species. So what's the difference between the two? Though they are very similar, it mostly has to do with where they were found and when they lived. Velox is the younger of the species, living during the Maastrichtian age about 66 million years ago, and is associated with the Hell Creek Formation, while Edmontonicus lived earlier during the Campanian, around 76 million years ago, 
being associated with a horseshoe canyon and dinosaur park formation. In terms of appearance, it had the typical build of its family, that being the Ornithomimidae, so appearing much like modern ratites. Velox is believed to have grown to 3 meters long and stand 1 meter toward the hip, while Edmontonicus was larger, being around 4 meters long and standing 1.2 meters toward the hip. Its jaws were toothless, having developed into a beak. The eyes were massive, giving it a wide field of view, and potentially great night vision. Like other members of its family, it had a large brain for its size, but that might not mean it was necessarily intelligent for a dinosaur as scientists believe the enlarged portions of its brain were dedicated to movement and coordination. It's not hard to believe they may have been in the same ballpark as ratites when it comes to intelligence. The neck was long, giving it plenty of flexibility to move the head freely and easily. The vertebrae were filled with air sacs, this in addition to its bones being extremely thin, meant Ornithomimus may have been quite lightweight for its size, with Edmontonicus being estimated to weigh about 170 kilograms. Its torso was shorter than its relatives, and though its arms were long, they were not as strongly built as other species, with three fingers, each tip with a straight claw. The legs were long and slender, with the tibia being 20% longer than the femur, a clear sign that Ornithomimus was built for running, and was likely very good at it. A study in 2001 was done on over 170 Ornithomimus foot bones, looking for signs of stress fractures, and surprisingly, they found none. Stress fractures are common on theropod foot bones, so why aren't we seeing them on Ornithomimus? It may have to do with them being so lightly built, but it's thought that a fair amount of the stress fractures seen on carnivorous theropods is due to them using their feet to attack or pin down struggling prey so Ornithomimus may have not used its feet in this way, likely using its beak to peck at prey and only going for animals much smaller than itself, which leads us to its diet. Ornithomimids in general are seen as generalist omnivores, and very little is known for certain, as having a beak makes it much harder to pin down exactly what their diet was. Evolving a beak and losing their teeth did not restrict them, however, in fact, it likely widened their range of things that they could eat, be that plant or animal. One of the best preserved skeletons of Ornithomimus preserves not only skin impressions, but feather impressions as well. In fact, four individuals have been found with evidence of feathers. These are present in both adults and juveniles, showing they had them throughout their lives, though it's not confirmed exactly what type of feathers they were. On the forearms of adults, they had either pinaceous feathers much like those seen on modern birds, or molofilamentous feathers, like those on emus and cassowaries. It also had ostrich-like features as well, as a specimen described in 2015, preserved tail feathers said to bear great similarity to ostriches, both in structure and distribution. The legs were covered in scales, being featherless from the feet up to the middle of the thigh, and then there was a flap of skin connecting the upper thigh to the torso, this structure is similar to what we find in modern birds as well. Such a wealth of fossils has allowed for some pretty accurate representations of Ornithomimus in series like Prehistoric Planet. And if we look back at older series like Prehistoric Park that show them featherless, we can see just how far the science has come over the years. In my opinion, the Ornithomimids as a group were the dinosaurs that needed feathers put on them the most. It just fits them so much better. But what do you think of Ornithomimus? The Hell Creek Speedster. And for my question of the week, which dinosaur family do you think benefits the most from having feathers put on them? Or which family doesn't benefit at all from having feathers added onto them? Whether it's factual they had them or not. What lesser known dinosaur would you like me to do a breakdown on next? And until then, please like, share, subscribe, and thank you for watching.